Special guest today, ex-linebacker from the Kansas City Chiefs, also a Patriot and a Cincinnati Bengal in his NFL career. We got Corey Mays on the line. Corey, thanks for joining us today, man. Good to have you. Good to be here to talk sports with you guys today. Uh, let's get it started. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we got to start with uh, with your Golden Domers, Corey, because Notre Dame with a big win over Michigan, their first uh, in a while over over the Wolverines. Just talk about how uh, you think Brian Kelly's doing and how you think the, the program's been turned around this year. I think it's really shaping up. Uh, I went to the USC game last year, was which was actually my first time back on campus since I graduated. And uh, I went to the game this year. And really uh, just seeing those guys live and in person, uh, seeing a lot of bigger guys, a lot of faster guys, a lot more skilled guys out there. No disrespect to anyone that's been there in the past, but uh, I feel like the, the program is going in the right direction. Uh, what was it like for you with your time at Notre Dame? Uh, I loved being there. It was a little turmoil with uh, with the coaches kind of going through. Uh, you know, I had Bob Davey my freshman year, and I redshirted. We had George O'Leary for five days. Uh, Ty Willingham for three years, and then uh, my last year was uh, Charlie White. So it's kind of a lot of a lot of turnover. But I mean, you, you can be prepared for any situation once you go through all that. Well, and you know, talking about Charlie Weiss, I mean, you, he uh, wound up in Kansas City in 2010. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? And I, he's kind of been a coach that has has a lot of notoriety uh, as being a good X's and O's guy on offense, but has kind of bounced around a little bit. What do you think about Charlie Weiss? Well, uh, he, he knows the stuff. That's one thing. You're going to go into the game being confident and knowing that, you know, you're going to feel like you're going to win the game. And that's the biggest thing and getting guys to, to buy into your system. And I know for him, you know, it was just another situation opened up for him. You know, why not, you know, why not take a head coaching job if you can? Uh, Brady Quinn is with our Kansas City Chiefs now. Uh, you played with him. Uh, what do you think of his performance? Uh, at Indy, uh, well, I mean, obviously he was a great player at Indy. Uh, you know, it hasn't really been a lot of opportunities, I guess, for him to really shine uh, in the league yet. But, you know, I know if he is given the right opportunity, he will shine. Well, you know, and going back to your uh, career, talk about being, you know, an undrafted free agent and, you know, how that journey to the NFL is a little bit different than being, you know, a drafted player out of the, you know, NFL draft. Well, being a free agent, uh, you basically, I mean, just like any other rookie, you're fighting from the bottom, but, you know, you, you really, it's really, you really don't feel any special at all. You know, it's just, you know, everyone to get drafted, they get drafted, you know, they get their names on TV, they get called. Uh, but for you as a free agent, it just makes you even more hungry because you know you have to fight from the bottom. You know, my rookie year, I walk into the, uh, into the meeting room, you know, there's 16 guys for eight spots. You know, and I'm the lonely uh, free agent. So, you know, it just, it just makes you work harder, and it makes you appreciate the privilege of being able to play. It's not a right. It is actually a privilege to be able to play in a National Football League. Uh, can never you talk about – oh, go ahead. No, I'm just saying never take it for granted. Oh, definitely. Uh, can you talk about uh, going back to the draft in 2006 and uh, if you were watching it and where you were thinking you might get picked? I thought maybe late round, maybe fifth, sixth, seventh round. Uh, a lot of teams started to to uh, call around, you know, late six, early seven, saying, you know, if we don't take you with these last couple of picks, we want to talk to you about free agency. And as a player, you don't want to hear that. You want to be drafted. But, you know, it worked out in the end. So I guess that. Well, you know, of course, you wind up in New England uh, with a – Tom Brady, the great Patriots, Bill Belichick. Just talk about your time there, playing with those guys, and, and uh, you know, you were on the, you know, guys like Vince Wilfork, the Rodney Harrison, and guys like that. I think for me, it was the best situation that I could come into, being a young guy and having all that veteran leadership around me. And those guys were really prepared every week, culture staff, everything. You know, the coaches didn't even have to police the locker room. The players did that. You know, if you got on the line, you were surrounded by six or seven veterans. I mean, you don't you don't want Richard Seymour running up on you. Trust me. Hey, but, good point. I mean, it was it was an invaluable experience in learning how to do things the right way when you come into the league. Well, and in 2009, uh, you wind up in Kansas City, where we are located. We cover the Chiefs, of course. Uh, Todd Haley, his first year there. Uh, Scott Pioli also comes over from New England in 2009. So a lot of people refer to that as the Chiefs becoming, you know, the Patriot way. Uh, talk about your time in Kansas City and how you 
felt uh, about Scott Pioli and how the program was run with Todd Haley? Really, for me, it was a smooth transition. I know a lot of guys, you know, they it was kind of a culture shock for them. But for me, coming from New England and then having Weiss my last year in, at Notre Dame, I, I, I pretty much knew the routine of how things were going to be run. So for me, it was kind of a smooth transition. Uh, I, was, I, I welcomed it, you know, being there and, and being around that program because I know what Scott brought to the program uh, when he was with New England. Uh, you also played for the Cincinnati Bengals in between uh, your time with the Patriots and Chiefs. Can you talk about playing for them, uh, Marvin Lewis, uh, Mike Zimmer, and um, Chad Johnson? I had a lot of fun playing in Cincinnati. Unfortunately, we didn't win a lot of games. But uh, there were a lot of guys, there were a lot of good guys there. I know Cincinnati gets a, a, you know, a bad rap, you know, for guys getting in trouble. But there were actually a lot of good guys on that team, a lot of good character guys on that team. And uh, of course, Chad was one of the one of the most funny guys. Uh, he's very entertaining. But what you see is what you get with Chad. So you know, for anybody that wants to know, he's not doing it for TV. That's Chad all the time. But he's a good guy, though. And I'll tell you what, you uh, in in 2009 had a significant amount of playing time. You know, and, as a linebacker for the Kansas City Chiefs. And you talk about the transition from 2009 to 2010 because in, in 010 the defense really stepped up, had a good season. Uh, how was that able to, to take place? Was it Romeo Cornell? I think uh, just getting guys back and, and buying into the system and just getting pieces into place. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, you have to go through, you know, a, a year of, of adjustment. And a lot of guys, you know, they have to learn how to adjust, you know, including me as well through all that. So you learn how to work together, and then the second year, it, it kind of all came together in jail. Uh, going back to Chad Johnson for a second, um, he didn't have a very successful time in New England. Things didn't work out in Miami. Um, is there anything with him that you saw maybe bad uh, work habits, uh, work ethic, or study habits? Uh, Chad worked extremely hard. You know, you're not gonna, you know, you're, you're not gonna question his work ethic. You're not gonna say anything about how he works. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's, it's the system. It's the system. You know, but. You know, unfortunately, you know, he had another incident this year uh, during training camp. But, you know, New England is a hard place. I mean, they will – New England will play whoever. You know, they don't care about names. If you get the system and you know it, you're going to play on Sunday because they want the best people who are going to win. So, you know, speaking – you know, as far as this season goes, give us, you know, just a little bit of uh, your take on what you've seen so far and maybe some of the surprises you've seen and also your take on the uh, replacement refs who are getting a little bit of uh, some heat today for sure. Yes, uh, I would say week three was probably the most entertaining uh, week of football I've ever seen in my life. From the uh, rep throwing the hat onto the uh, ground in the end zone and the Cowboy players tripping, what if he had gotten hurt, you know, uh, to, the, to, to the play last night, to Golden Tate yelling, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I hope he didn't uh, make himself a viral uh, <laughs> forever, forever. Um, you know, it's, 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 been a, it's been very entertaining. I think Arizona is one of the biggest surprises I've seen. And, uh, you know, you had two exciting overtime games, Detroit, Tennessee, and Miami, and the Jets uh, this weekend. I think Arizona is one of the most surprising teams as of right now. And I didn't think the Niners would lose if I had to predict. <laughs> that, that, that's the craziness of the NFL, of course. And uh, you know, the, your former team, the Kansas City Chiefs, with a, a big overtime thriller against uh, – the Saints as well. I mean, how do you feel? Uh, how much have you watched the Chiefs this year, and how do you feel? Uh, you know, the, in the direction they're going. Uh, I, I feel like you know. I, I, I talked to, uh, well, briefly talked to Javier the other day through text messages. He accidentally uh, texted me, and I told him, you know, good luck. <laughs> uh, he was actually trying to restore Greenwood, but uh, you know, those things happen. But I, I told him, you know, just stay in there and fight. Make sure you guys are fighting. Because, you know, the same thing happened to them last year. They started off 0-3, and then they fought back to, to get 3-3. and I felt like, you know, they have a talented team. You know, they, they just got to execute. You know, and this is the NFL. You know, you might have a lot of talent. It's just making sure people, you know, execute every week and are consistent. But I think with Jamal getting his wheels back, I think, you know, with the defense, you know, everybody is going to fit into their place. I, you know, I, I figured them to win the AFC West this year. So... I'm hoping they can come through with it. Oh, yeah, us too, definitely. Um, do you know who Javier was trying to reach when he texted you? 
Corey Greenwood. <laughs> Uh, well, talk, before we let you go, Corey, give us a little update on you know where you're at now, what you're up to, and uh, how things are going for you here in 2012. Well, I'm relaxing. I uh, actually retired in uh, in May. I love the game, but sometimes the business is a little funny. But I decided, you know, plenty of other things I can do in my life. Right now, I'm uh, traveling, spending a lot of time with family and friends, um, looking into different business ventures. Uh, I did the broadcast boot camp uh, in June at NFL Films over over the summer, so that was very eye-opening. I have a lot more respect for media and broadcasting and everything that you guys do because it, it definitely isn't easy. It isn't like doing an interview. You have to know what you're talking about because people will call you out. So, I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing with me right now, and just relaxing and enjoying life and doing all those things I couldn't do while I was playing. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Steve Sable recently. Uh, you worked with NFL Films. Did you get a chance to meet him or hear any stories or anything like that? I didn't get to meet him, but really being there and just seeing everything that they've done for the NFL is, is, is actually very humbling. And, you know, I think it is a great loss to the NFL for him to be gone. And, you know, I just wish his family and everyone else was close to him, you know, prayers. Uh, absolutely. I mean, NFL films, you know, I'm sure, and that goes for you as well. Just growing up, that was such a, you know, such a, you know, educational tool, you know, for us fans growing up, that, you know, getting to, to know the older players and coaches and stuff like that. So, yeah, the NFL films is more valuable, I think, than a lot of people realize. Oh, it's extremely valuable. From the football college to the first time you saw that spiral spinning in slow motion in the air for about 10 seconds to the receiver caught it. You know, it's just those, those little things are, are so impactful. Upon at least my generation, anyway. Uh, I might be the last generation. Everybody else is. Yeah. All the young people, they might not remember all those, all those uh, videos. Uh, you, everything valuable, maybe except for that uh, that Raiders theme they came up with. I'm not sure Autumn if that. Wind. The Autumn Wind's a pirate. Yeah, we maybe could do without that. One. <laughs> great stuff from John Facenda on the music as well. But uh, I'll tell you what, Corey, we are about out of time here on the Outsiders podcast. Cannot thank you enough for being on today. We definitely look forward to having you back. You are definitely a, a natural at this, and good and good luck here in the future. Appreciate it. Have me on any time. Have me on any time. Hey, I appreciate will, it, guys. All right. Thanks a lot, Corey. All righty. Have a good one. You too.